All right, so um, we've been walking through Galatians, and uh, several of you have commented like, wow, there's a lot of really complicated stuff in here. And that's true. And I do have to confess also that um, even though I'd read through the book of Galatians a few times before I decided to preach through this, there have been several texts that I came to and I'm like, oh man, this is, this, this, this is a complicated text. <laughs> and this morning we're going to look at a fairly complicated text. And I could really dig into a whole bunch of this. I mean, there was one book that I saw about Galatians 4 this week that was 380 pages long. Notice I didn't say it. I read it. I just said I saw that it existed. A Galatians, just about, a book just about Galatians 4 that was 380 pages long. So I'm not going to try to dig in and cover all that. Because the bears are playing at noon. Um, but there are a couple things that are really important in this passage. And they're really clear. Sometimes there's this whole mass of stuff. And we can easily get distracted by the little details. And, and we end up sometimes in the church arguing and wrestling about. Oh, what exactly does this mean? When in. Sometimes I think we almost use that as an excuse to face the stuff that's obviously in there. I don't know. The Lord is either pleased or not pleased. I don't know yet. You can let me know. Samuel Clemens said, when I read the Bible, it's not the things I don't understand that bother me. It's the things I do understand. And as we look at this passage, I think that that's a, wis a piece of wisdom that we should hold on to. Sometimes we understand things and we don't like it. So anyway, let's try to find the clear, understandable things in this passage. I want to read Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God... You were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God. Now I want to stop right there. We'll come back to this. But if you don't hear anything else I say, notice that. So often we talk about, oh, did you find Jesus? That person knows God. Paul is saying... Probably more important is not the fact that we know God, but it all starts with the fact that we are known by God. And that's cool, isn't it? I remember growing up, the, the governor of Iowa where we grew up was Terry Branstad. And it just happened through several things that my dad knew Terry Branstad, the governor. And I actually met him and, and, and got to know him a little bit. And when I was about 19 or 20, I was working at Adventureland, the amusement park that, where I met my wife, actually. And the governor was there doing something. I don't know what it was. He had all his entourage and, you know, maybe it's interesting that, you know, 30 years ago, governors had entourages and now rappers do. I don't know what that says about our society. But I'm working, I, I'm working there and I'm walking through Adventureland and the governor sees me and says, Mark Morris, how are you? And there were like two people. I wanted there to be a bunch of people that like heard him say that, you know, because to be known by the governor, that's pretty cool. Even if you don't like the governor, to be known is cool. And Paul is saying, you are known by God. Let's come back to that. How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principle, principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. 
As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are jealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may be jealous, zealous for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always and not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Now we're going to look at the verses following that to, as well, but let's stop there for now. Now, I, w- I want you to notice something. If you've been around as we've been studying through Galatians, it, it's very obvious that in the book of Galatians, Paul's attitude is different than many of his other letters. When he writes to other letters, he he always starts off by saying, my dear children whom I love, I pray for you. I hear about your faith. He says all these wonderful things. And at the beginning of Galatians, he says, you, you know, hi, let's talk. And that's kind of the tone of the first several chapters of this book. He is clearly not happy. In fact, at one point, he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Basically, he's saying to them, you idiots, what's going on in your head? What are you thinking? But in this passage, if you read it, you begin to notice that his tone is softer. In verse 12, he says, I plead with you, brothers. In verse 18, he says, or verse 19, he says, my dear children. He's talking to them with the heart of a pastor. And then going on, we actually see that in verse 28, he says, now you brothers. He calls them brothers. And in verse 31, he says, therefore, brothers. And he's not just saying brothers as in men. He's talking to all of them and he's treating them as family members. So I want you to know that this is written with the heart of a shepherd. But what he's saying in this passage is there's a difference in our lives between when we're walking with God and when we're not. In verse 8 and 9, he says, you know, formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, he says, how is it you are turning back? He's saying, look, you didn't used to know God, and you lived in a way that was enslaved, and then you knew God, and you were set free. We talked last week, and if you... If you didn't have a chance to catch that message, um, I I encourage you to go back because he says, you are now sons and heirs. You are God's children. But then you're going back. He says, why are you going back to that? and, And I want you to stop with me this morning and ask this question. Um, do you relate to that at all? As as you look at your life, if you're a Christian, do you feel like, man, how am I back here again? You ever look at your life and say, how can it be that I'm struggling with the same thing I struggled with last year or five years ago or 10 years ago? In fact, many of us in this room right now could say, there's this thing that I have been battling with for decades. 
And maybe it's something very tangible and specific. Maybe it's something more kind of broad and vague like I struggle with pride or I struggle with self-reliance or I struggle with this tendency. You know, some of us have, have struggled with the fact that we say things and as soon as it's out of our mouth, we're thinking, oh, why did I say that? Or if you're like me, you have those moments when something is on your way out of your mouth and it's not even out yet. And you're like, stop. Oh, it's too late. Do you ever look at yourself and say, how am I still here? How do I still struggle with this? And that's what Paul is asking the Galatians. He says, why are you still there? And, but he's not doing it as a, as a scolding. He's doing it as a shepherd saying, oh man, I want better for you. Those of us who are parents, probably every one of us, has had moments when we thought, oh man, I see the battles of my kids, and I want better for them because I love them. And this fact that we tend to return to our old habits is true in, I think, pretty much every area of life, right? There are some of us in this room um, that and, and I'm fortunate that I never, this was never my battle, but some of you in this room, you started smoking at one point in your life and you've quit multiple times. And you're like, man, I want to be free from that. I know people that have struggled with, that have faced that battle with alcohol. And they're like, man, how do I get pulled back into this thing that enslaves me. That's what he's saying. I think it's even true in, in something as, as kind of silly as, well, a musical instrument. When you play guitar, one of the most difficult things about playing guitar is that in order to really do it well, you have to wrap your hand around in a way that if you've ever tried to learn guitar, Kenny's learning guitar right now, and uh, you know that feeling where you're like, oh, getting my hand around there is hard. And sometimes over time, you slide back. When you learn piano, they tell you, okay, you've got to have your fingers a certain way, and you don't want to have your fingers flat, you want to have them nicely bent. And when you first learn, that's hard. And if you don't continue to remind yourself, you backslide. That's true, isn't it? Somebody nod if this makes sense to you, that you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, I wanted you to do an exercise, a mental exercise with me, wherever you are. If you're sitting in your your living room, if you're watching this on Wednesday, or if you're sitting here in the room now. Imagine for a moment that you were to draw a mental line, kind of graphing your progress from the moment when Jesus became real to you. Or if Jesus has never been real to you, even at the moment when you started to feel like, okay, i got to figure out this God thing. What would that chart look like? Would there be a, a lots of ups and downs? I, I think most of us would say, yeah. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Hills and valleys are unavoidable. But the overall ongoing trend should be upward. Right? 
that we are knowing more about Jesus, that we are knowing Jesus better, that we are becoming more and more like him. We call that sanctification, the process of us being made by the work of the Spirit into something that God wants us to be. But I'll tell you, uh, there's a lot of times in my life where I think, man, I wish I could go back to that time. That was when I was really close to God. Because sometimes I think that we have the wrong idea about what God wants to do in our lives. We think that God wants to make us into some model of this. That, that there's some... Well, but there is. Romans 8, 28, everybody quotes all the time, that says, you know, all things work together for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We're like, oh, everything works together for the good. That's great. But we don't really always go on to the next verse that says, that tells us what the good is. And verse 29 says um, that what, we will be, what will happen is we will be shaped into the likeness of Christ. We'll become like Jesus. And that's my question. And this is what I think Paul is getting at here. Is are you becoming more like Jesus? Or are we just kind of doing the Christian life? Another way to say this is to ask the question, do you ever get frustrated with yourself? I mean, other people might drive you crazy. Other drivers on the road might make you rip your hair out. Other people might make you just so frustrated. But do you ever stop and look at yourself and say, oh, Self, what's wrong with you? Now, notice something in here. What is Paul pointing out that they're doing wrong? He says, do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. You hear what he's saying to them? He's saying... Yeah, how dare you? I mean, are they doing like pagan idolatry? No. Are they, are they involved in violence or sexual sin or some sort of real division among themselves? It, that doesn't appear to be true. He is basically saying the problem is you are trying too hard to earn God's favor. You're doing all these duties. You're focusing on trying harder and doing this ritual and this festival and this day. And, and one of the questions that I read today, read this week that was intriguing to me, was this question. What if Satan's strategy in your life is not to get you to do bad things? What if Satan's strategy is to get you to do good things for the wrong reasons. For those of us who've grown up in church, I think that's a convicting question, isn't it? It's so easy to slip into this idea that I'm trying hard to do the right thing. Now, he's not saying we shouldn't try hard to do the right thing. Obviously, we should try hard to do the right thing. But not because we think in some way that's what it means to be a Christian. Not because we think that that will earn us favor. Not because we want to impress anybody else. But because we know that Jesus purchased us on the cross. And it is. It's gratitude. In today's situation, Paul might write it this way. He's saying, 
you're checking boxes is what you're doing. You're, you're going to church. Check. Sing songs. Check. Pray prayers. Check. You know, stop saying bad words. Check. 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 Imagine for a moment. I mean, he's talking about a relationship between us and God, right? He said, you know God or, and you're known by God. It's a relationship. Imagine if your marriage, if you're married, consisted of this. Wives, imagine that your husband comes home and says, Hi, honey. Check. Kiss wife. Check. Now, some of you are like, I could do worse. But the reality is that's not what a love relationship is. He's saying, don't stick, don't, don't get stuck in box checking. In fact, in, in last week's passage, and we didn't really wrestle with this, he says in, in verse 3, So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. Now, let me, let me help you with this a little bit. Because that word, basic principles of the world, that phrase, he's referring to the world in a negative sense. Like he's saying, we are captured by the worldly stuff around us. And now he's saying what that stuff is. And you know what it is? It's religious duty. He is saying, in fact, other places, he describes that as basically satanic influence. He is saying satanic influences try to get us wrapped up in pursuing the good instead of the best. You kind of get what he's getting at here? He's saying God wants more for you and God wants you to move on. Wouldn't it be great if, if at every stage of our life we could look back and say, okay, there's, there's ups and downs, but I'm moving forward. I have a, a closer relationship with God. I'm more like Jesus than I was before. Not because I'm trying hard on the outside, but because I'm being transformed from the inside. Here's the problem. We can't fix ourselves. So why do we fall into this? Why do we get stuck in this try hard, work hard, do it, you know, judge everything by the outside, check the box, check the box, check the box. Anybody else in this room ever had a time in their life when you're like, I am checking all the boxes and my spiritual life is dry and dead. Anybody? Yeah. Why do we fall into this? And in a way, in the rest of this passage, Paul kind of explains why we fall into it. One way is it's easier. Right? It's easier because it's so easy to define. If I say, if you say to me, love your wife. Okay, can you be more specific? Well, you know. Do the things we just talked about. Say hi when you come home. Hi, honey. Check. Give her a kiss. Check. Oh, you know, let me take you out for dinner. Check. Somehow the general, the vagueness of a relationship is hard. Look at verses 21 and following. He says, Basically, he takes him back and he says, do you remember in the Old Testament when there was Abraham and Sarah? And he doesn't tell them a lot of the story because they would have known this. But Abraham and Sarah had been called by God to be a blessing to the world. And they left their home and they went out. And in order for them to be blessed, they had to have children. 
That was part of the plan. And they got to the point where they're like, we're getting pretty old. And we don't have children yet. And so Sarah, some of you women will say, I don't get this. Sarah says, I'm getting pretty old. Why don't you have a child with my slave woman? Um, no. <laughs> but Abraham goes along with it. In fact, that was kind of a common thing in that society that if, if you weren't able to have children, then you would have somebody else from your household, often a slave woman, that you would use for that situation. Now, do you see what's happening there? God has promised, I will bless you. I will, I will make your descendants numerous, and I will impact all the nations of the world through you. And they have a choice. We can trust God that God's going to do this. Or we can say, oh, it's up to us. It's a choice between trusting God and doing something that doesn't trust God. Do you see what I'm saying? And they choose... To do what is easier and more natural for them. And another reason that we fall into this, kind of the, the routine, is that it's familiar, right? Now, I can't say that I, and I said earlier, I never got into cigarettes, mostly because when I was in high school, my main activities were, um, I was a runner and I was in, I was in choir. And those are both things where they tell you smoking, not a good choice. No track coach ever in the history of the world has said, okay, boys, I want you to start smoking because it'll make you run faster and farther. No. But uh, so I don't say that to make myself sound holy. I think I just had the right people around me. But... Um, a lot of the reason people will tell me that they go back to smoking is because it's familiar. They're like, and, and I remember one very specific conversation with a guy who was trying to quit. And he said, the problem is, I don't know what to do with my hands when I'm stressed. So I smoke because it's familiar. And sometimes that's what we do with religion. In, chapter, in verse 10. Paul said. What do you do when you're going back to. Observing days and months. And seasons and years. And rituals and all this stuff. You know what it says. He's saying you're going back to the familiar. You're going back to the things you know you can do. Even though you know. That that stuff is not right. It's not good. But it's familiar. You've heard the phrase at some point in your life probably. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. But Paul is saying. Okay how about if we choose not to go with a devil. <laughs> how about we get free from that. But the other reason that this is true. In their life and in our lives is I think that sometimes we go back to the rituals and the, and the legalisms and just any sort of backsliding. This is, it really isn't about legalism as much as it's just about slipping back into old habits. Verse 17, he says, Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. There's pressure. Somebody's saying, you should do this. You should live your life this way. You should follow this rule. You should do this thing right now. And, and there's all this pressure. And in Galatians chapter 1, Paul had written, he said, am I trying to please God or man? And there are so many times in our life, even in the church, 
that we settle for less than what God has called us to simply because it's popular. I have had students tell me over the years many times, even at a a Christian school or a Bible college, that there's kind of a, a carefully defined, unconscious level of This is how spiritual you're supposed to be. But don't go above that. Don't go below that. Just be right in here. And Jesus is calling us to something greater. Jesus said crazy things like, you will do greater things than me. We are called to know this Jesus better than we've ever known him before. We are called to live arm in arm with this father in a way that we've never known him before, regardless of what people around us are doing. Now, we want to grab people on our way and and say, come with me. We are called to be walking with the Spirit in a way that we have never even known that would make our parents and our grandparents and our friends and our neighbors say, that's crazy, because ultimately, God is calling us to more. And Paul is saying, you're settling for less. You're Abraham and Sarah. Trying to help God out. Not because God has called you to something, but because you don't trust God. Does that make sense? I I know there's kind of some depth here, but... Here's the key. Jesus paid it all. When Jesus died on the cross, his last word was, it is finished, which is one word in Aramaic. It's done. I don't need to help God out. God chooses to use us. And God says, hey, I have some things that I need you to do. Well, no. Things he's calling us to do. He doesn't need us to do it. God has never thought, oh man, I was going to do this. But, you know, the people of Thorn Creek Reformed Church let me down. So uh, I guess I won't do that. God will do what God will do. And God is going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. But he's done this amazing thing where he said, hey, come be part of it. Get to know me. Walk with me. Live with me. Spend time with me. Trust my word. And all the rest of this passage is about that choice. Do we try in our own flesh to make it work? Or do we say, Jesus made it work? And we just trust him. So how do we break out of this cycle? The cycle of three steps forward, two steps back. Or sometimes it's two steps forward and three steps back. Number one, I think this passage calls us to choose where we get our our identity from. Do we get our identity from what we do? How many times we go to church? Whether people look at us and say, that's a good Christian. Or do we get our identity from the fact that the Father of Jesus has called us his children. 
We need each other. Please understand, I'm not saying that ignore everybody else and just focus on God. That's not what the Scripture teaches at all. Scripture teaches that we need to come together and follow Him together, but ultimately our identity needs to say, though none go with me, still I will follow. Choose your identity. Secondly, see yourself through God's eyes. You know how God sees you? If you ever watch the music, the musical, The Music Man, Julie and I went to see this, a production of this, just last week in uh, Kankakee. And there's this wonderful moment in that, in that show when the chill, this, if you don't know the story, there's a totally shady salesman who is selling band instruments and uniforms to all the people of this town, River City in Iowa. Because I guess, supposedly, according to this show, Iowans are stubborn and pig-headed. I don't see that at all. But um, he's a total fraud. He doesn't have a way to teach them anything. But at the end, the kids are playing their instruments. And there's this wonderful, beautiful moment when the parents are like, that's my Bobby. Play to me, Charlie. And I don't remember the names, but it's, it's beautiful because through the ears of a parent, they see the best that their child can offer as a beautiful thing. And that's why many, many, many of us have had pictures on our fridge by our children and our grandparents and our cousins that are awful. I promise you, there will be some horribly unrecognizable artwork by Jordan Joy DeYoung that will find its way into the house of John and Laurel. And they will see that thing as beautiful. God sees us. As beautiful. Choose your identity. See yourself through God's eyes. And lastly. See yourself as a soldier. As a person called. With a purpose. And that purpose is bigger than we can ever accomplish. So because. God called Abraham and Sarah. He said, all the nations of the world will be blessed by you. That's kind of big. But they understood they could trust God because they were called to a battle. There's a lot more in this passage, but I want you to know that we all have a choice. We can trust God and move forward. And there'll be ups and downs. Or we can do it on our own. And maybe there won't be as many ups and downs. But we'll never get anywhere. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your spirit. We 